screen. Um, can I just check if everyone can hear me okay? If anybody can't, then just do pop it in the chat. Um, yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen. So um, good morning everyone, my name is Lisa Cummins and I'm a senior analyst in Well CCDs or now we're becoming North East London CCDs um, and today I'm going to take you through how to create Sankey diagrams um, using OR. Um, I hope you've all had the chance to install and download the packages and um, if you haven't it would be great if you could do so as we're going through these introductory slides. Um, I'll quickly go through the agenda. So what we're going to cover is um, a very brief introduction to um, what Sankey diagrams are. <clears throat> and what we'll do is we'll spend most of the morning working through practical examples. Um, so the first will be an example using some data that I've already partially transformed. And we'll use that data to create a Sankey diagram using the network G3 pa package. This data will be um, itself uh, readmissions, so acute readmissions. Then we'll have a bit of a break um, and then we'll come back and, and work through the, the next part. And this will be again more of a practical session around um, generating a readmission ID so that we can visualize the flow of related admissions. And this will be mainly done using the Deepfire package. And um, hopefully we will have time to generate another Sankey diagram as well after that. So a very short history of Sankey diagrams. Um, they're typically used to visualize flows between two or more entities or points in a process. They're named after a fellow Irish person, Captain Matthew Henry Phineas Swell Sankey, who in 1898 um, developed um, a Sankey diagram to visualize or to show the energy efficiency of a steam engine. And today they're commonly used in science, engineering, and other settings as well. Um, I, in my experience, have found them useful for visualizing how people interact with healthcare services. So I've shown two examples here of how I've used them over the last couple of months. On the left hand side, is an example of secondary care data, which we will go through today. And it's looking at groups of readmissions within 30 days of discharge. And on the right hand side, <clears throat> it's an example using primary care data, which I presented at um, the NHSOR conference, which um, is where this webinar has come out of. Um, so a bit more about what we're gonna focus on today. Um, so we're going to look at acute readmissions and the aim of this piece of work was to visualise kind of patient level acute readmissions that are happening within 30 days of discharge. So what I was interested in um, was that first that, that first admission that a patient had, whether it was acute or it could have been critical care. And then I'm looking to see if the patient was discharged. In the example, we'll, we're going to look at whether the person was discharged home to a step down bed or whether or not they thought they passed away. And then if they were readmitted again within 30 days, I've included them in, in our cycle in the flow. Um, the point at which kind of like the flow or the cycle breaks is if there was if the person had no further admission or if the readmission took place more than 30 days after discharge. Um, so this is basically the resulting visualization after a lot of data wrangling. Um, before we go into the OR and the workings that we're going to do, um, I'll quickly explain a bit more about a sample diagram, just in terms of the terminology and, and what, what it contains. Um, so these rectangles here, um, these are known as nodes. And they are joined together by arcs of what you could, some people might also call arrows. So the starting node, um, so this, this starting node um, typically is called a source node. 
and it is joined then linked together what we call target nodes through our arcs or arrows. Um, the size of um, the nodes and the arcs are proportional to the information that they um, proportion to the volume that they represent. So in our example here, um, we're looking at number of discharges, number of emissions, sorry, and then here we're looking at number of discharges. And as we move through the diagram, our source nodes become our, our target nodes, sorry. So if we go back here, you can see that this is our, our source and these are our target nodes. And as we move through our psyche, the target nodes um, become our source nodes. And then the um, nodes which our X flow to become our, our next target nodes unless it's the end of a process and then it just nothing kind of will flow from this one. <clears throat> so it's important to think of, of these uh, pairs of <clears throat> these linked source and target nodes as pairs because when we're creating your psyche diagram we need to know the number of times each pair of source and target nodes occur within our data. Now this probably seems a bit abstract but it will be clearer in a moment and as we go through it through the OR um, scripts. The main challenge in creating this graph is getting your data in the right shape. So what I started with for this exercise was um, SOS data. So what we're gonna work through today is a fully anonymized data set, which is kind of going structured in a similar, similar way to how um, SOS data would be used or it would be structured. And I'm hoping that some of you will are on the call are familiar with that data set. But typically you have um, some patient ID, some admission ID, and admission and discharge date. You'll be able to generate um, the type of admission um, using some critical care data. And then this variable I've also created, which is called discharge status, is based on the discharge destination of where the patient um, is recorded as being discharged to. Um, and what we need to do is we need to transform the data from this structure into a readmit, readmission level data, which shows kind of the series of admissions per patient. Um, and then from this, we need to be able to get our data into um, um, it's a shorter data set or data frame, which will have our source and our target nodes along with the frequency at which they occur. So that's why I was kind of emphasizing the importance of um, thinking about our data set or the, each of these source and, that, and target nodes as pairs, because ultimately this is what we want to create. Otherwise, the, we won't be able to run the Sankey D3 package. So I hope that uh, makes a little bit of sense. It will make a lot more sense as, um, as we go through the day, the morning. So what we're gonna focus on first is um, creating a psyche diagram um, use starting at this point. So I've shared with you um, some readmission level data that I've already transformed. The reason why I didn't just start doing all of this together, because it's a lot to take in and it would be a lot easier to kind of move from this point to this point, um, knowing exactly why we're kind of, or what we're doing here. So that's why I've done that. So I hope that all makes sense. Does anyone have any uh, quick questions or should we move straight into the R session?
So can you all see my screen? I hope the font is an okay size for you. So I hope you've managed to install and load your packages. I've had some technical issues, so I'm using the cloud today. So I hope everything goes okay, because this is my first time using it. So. So what I, we're going to do is work through this example. So when I import my data, I always um, just pick it up to make sure um, the, the way it's formatted and structured is how I would expect it to be. Um, I know that I don't need to change any of these variables, so we, we can just move straight ahead. But in the afternoon, we will need to just do a bit of reformatting because we're working with dates. So I'm going to quickly show you what the data looks like. Yep, so it's exactly the, that readmission level data that I showed you earlier on. So we need to create a data frame um, that contains the number of times each pair of source and target nodes occur. So if we can remember that, that, that will help us kind of get through the next few sections. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a character, add a number to our character variables, so each of our flow variables so that we can use that to specify the order that the entities appear in the sequence. And this is important for ensuring that related nodes are linked uh, when we summarize our data later on. So we're going to use a combination of um, dplyr and the paste function. So just in case you're not familiar with the paste function, I will quickly um, run through that. So just as a quick example, the character, we're going to just create a character called, I'm just going to specify that it's acute. I'll show you that if you look here, acute pops up. And I'm going to add an underscore and a one. And we use the paste zero function. Now you can see that using this paste function, all I've done is added an underscore one to, to this um, data item that I created. So I'm going to basically add an underscore one to this column, and I want to add an underscore two to this column, and underscore three here, and so on and so forth. And to do this, I'm going to call this um, object exactly what it is, the cycle flow, and I'm going to add a number to it. And I'm going to change the row, I'm going to use the row data table. So we're going to use our mutate function. So we're going to go flow underscore one is equal to case when flow underscore one is not black. And I'm going to add a case zero. So one, and I'm going to set at um, underscore one to the end. So we're just 
quickly take a look and see if that's done what I've asked it to do. So I've made a lip bar here. I think it should hopefully just be that additional one that I added. And there you have it. So that is for one. I just spotted that I'm using my case when, and that's because um, in an earlier script, um, these eddies would have appeared as um, blanks. Um, but when I exported and imported, they did appear as eddies. So you could amend this. I'm just going to carry on as it is for now. Um, let me just back to my mind. Notice here that I've made a lot of mistakes. So we don't need, <coughs> we want these NAs to be NAs. So I'm going to actually have to go back and deal with the way I was doing it to start um, using this case when. Sorry for that. So this is what we want our data to look like. Um, I'm going to add in another row and I'll do it to the work this time. So if you remember just the example without adding the case where, um, what you end up is having an NA underscore three, but we don't want that because in a while we're going to want to remove all the NAs. And we don't want them counted when we're doing our restructuring of our data. So it's good to make a mistake because then it's probably clearer why I've done what I've done. So I'm going to score five. So I'm going to do exactly what I've done. So I'm going to use my case when and I'm going to say when flow underscore five not equal to three. I'm going to paste. 
you're going to paste basically the value of underscore five to my flow <coughs> underscore fly variable. Uh, I forgot my bucket. Take a quick look at my data in the case that I wanted it to do. And you can see here it's done exactly what I've asked it to do. So the next step that we're going to do is just sort of summarize our data to get the frequency um, of the combinations of the different flows. So we're going to basically remove the readmission ID. And this flow number, this flow number column actually just tells us the number of um, entities in, in the flow. Um, so here you can see it's three, and here we've got two, and so on. You may spot it in the data. We've got five, the in the flow column five. Um, we've got some that are not completed, and this will become clear in, in the next session later this morning. But with some people have. A really high number of readmissions and if we don't kind of cap our theories or cycle at some point our cycle can become um really long and, and a bit um wieldy so all i'm going to do here is use um my group five and as you can see i'm kind of just calling my objects exactly what they are um, this, I don't, other people probably do things a little bit differently, but I find this helps me remember what I've done and why I've done it. I'm going to use group by, um, I'm going to group by all of my flow variables. So by the flow, so one, two, three. Four and five. And then next we would summarize. To get the number of times each of these occur. So again, let's see. Spelled something incorrectly, so that's what's happened there. Um, if we take a quick look at the data, the, it's reduced the number of rows to 58, and we now just have six variables. And the reason why I haven't yet um, tried to get the frequency of um, kind of the combinations is because we need to do just one or two more things before we can do that. And to, to get those frequencies of those pairs, um, what we're going to do is create subsets of the table that we've just created. And in, in each of these, we will have what we will call, um, so we'll have two columns. Um, and they will contain, so let's say, for, for example, this first one that we want to create, I'm going to call it flow one to two. And in that <coughs> table, we're going to basically take column one and two. And then we're going to take column six as well. And then in the next one we're going to create, I'm going to take column two and three and column six. And then once we have these um, four tables, with three columns, then I'm going to um, bind them together, and then we can get frequencies of each of the count times of each of these um, source and kind of target numbers that come from the graph. From the graph, okay. So all 
what I want to do is just select those columns. So as I select them, I'm going to give them a new name. Otherwise, we won't be able to um, bring them together later on. So I'm going to call that first column in, and that second column is going to be out. And then I'm just going to leave um, that sixth column. So I'll leave this end for now. I think that's fine. I just run that. Oh, um, so here we've got an error, an error is saying um, it's added the missing grouping variables. And that's because I've never added my um, own group by here. And this is really important to make sure you've always had your own groups because you could, in, but if you forget, you could inadvertently make any decision and not realize it. And we're going to, especially in the afternoon, when we're doing more transforming. Um, um, or we're going to be doing lots of groups and groups. So I like that now. So we're going to be on this again. And as you can see, we didn't get this error. So I'm going to quickly show you what we've just created, just to make sure you understand. Um, so here we've got our in, our out, and our number. And you can see here, it's exactly what's in this first column, the second column, and the sixth column. And I'm just going to create three more of these. So we're going to go two to three this time. No. Could have called the in, the out, the source, and the target number. Probably it may have been a bit more intuitive. So, if you want to do that, you can. And if we take a look here, again, we've just taken our column two and our column three and our column six. So, copy this and this. And I'm going to just change this to three and four and change this to a three and a four. And change this to a four and a five and this one to a four and a five. I'm going to run those. And they've popped in here. Now the next thing I'm going to do. <coughs> Combining these into a single data frame with three columns. And we're going to use the <clears throat> four byte um, four byte function. And literally, all you have to do is just add in the name of the table that you want to combine. So I'm going to do that now. I think we could take a look at our data. And you can see it's got 232 rows and three columns. If you go all the way down, it shows our four to fives. And so <clears throat> what we need to do now is basically just aggregate or use our group by summarize this data and we get our frequencies. But before that, I'm going to, um, first of all, we need to filter out some of, of the, the data. Um, so here you can see that we've got a couple of NAs um, in our in and our out volume. And these are basically um, so I'm going to go back here and show you what I mean. So you can see when we go, when we've created our, our subset tables, um, for our four to five, there's an NA and an NA because uh, this particular readmission group only had two in the series. So I'm going to filter out these NAs because we don't need them. 
And then also what I'm going to do is filter out um, um, anywhere in our in column where there is um, an endpoint. So that would be somebody who's, who's died or, or been displaced and not been made missing because they're being captured in our end column. I hope that makes sense. So I'm going to use the filter function. I'm going to filter out all our heads that is going to keep all of any rows where um, there's not an NA in our outcome. And I'm going to use the string detect function. Um, to include um, to filter out where it says either that where where the, where the character is either not either like um died or disturbed. Reduced to 166. I'm going to quickly just click into the data again. Um, I'm going to show you a little funny one here <clears throat> where we've got um, somebody who's, who's died, but then it's also saying that they ended up in critical care. Um, I think what's happened in this case is when I transformed the data. Two of these events probably took place in the same day. Um, and it's just one case, and that's why I filtered um, the any strings where the is died or discharged. It's just one or two. If it's just one or two, then you know it's probably just like something funny in the data. But if this has happened, if there's a high number of cases, then you probably want to check your data to make sure that your transforms that you've done earlier. Are correct. So this basically just reduces the rows down to 165. And now what I'm going to do is use my group by to get the frequency of the combinations of each of these in and out pairs or source and target nodes. I'm going to call this new variable or column frequency. Um, also, don't forget to ungroup. I'm going to quickly run that. Data. And if we go back in and take a look at our data. Um, now we basically got um, a list of each, of each flow for each link node and the number of times it occurs. We might quickly just pop up the graph here. So if we go like this, maybe we can see here. That to move from acute to acute, it's around 1800 cases. Which I think is close to the eight. And that's exactly what's kind of represented here from this node into this, um, this source node here into this target node. So that's about 1800. Well, it's 1800 so far. Um, when we create a graph, when you hover over it in a while, you, you can actually see it always, but when you take a screenshot, you can't. Um, so hopefully that'll be just clear. So there are any questions at this point, because what we'll do next is um, do the next one or two steps we need to do before we create the graph.
Please feel free to put your questions in the chat or if you want to put your hand up or unmute yourself if you have any questions for Lisa. I just had a quick question about um, do, doing some of this stuff like before you get the data into R and just in terms of whether you kind of get the same results. Obviously, if you were to use, I don't know, Excel or SQL or something to, to take the raw data set and get it into the shape we've sort of gone through, if there's any sort of issues with that. Um, yeah, um, that's a good question. So the first time I did try to do this, I tried to do it in SQL. Um, and... Actually, it wasn't even this part, it was the earlier part, which we're going to do later on with creating a readiness study. And I just ended up having like kind of like temporary, well, kind of common expression tables within common, like it was almost like inception, just going around in circles. Um, so that's why I then ended up moving to R. And this was kind of one of the first things I actually did when I started learning R, I was trying to create a sanctuary graph, um, which is about probably about a year ago now. Um, so I probably would recommend using R rather than SQL. Cool, That's wicked. Fine. No, I, I just wanted to see, obviously, because like, um, I guess it's just dependent on experience. Um, mm -hmm. So, but it'll be good to try and obviously I'll see what happens if I do it um, this way and that way. And then obviously it seems like you've I found this way to be more, more sort of beneficial. So that's great, thanks. Any other questions? Okay. So the next thing we're going to do, let me just get this out. Should I? Sorry. Um, I can make the screen a little bit bigger again. So what we're going to do next is to create the graph. So we need to change, we need to create an ID um, for each of the entity names because um, the network D3 package, it reads the, um, it, it doesn't read character names, it reads the, the ID that we're gonna to assign to them now. And so the first thing we're gonna do is create a node data frame, which lists every entity involved in the flow. Um, and this, each entity is basically um, each of these. So it's a Q1, a Q2, for a step down three or whatever it may be. We just basically just need a list of those. Um, you could use base or to do it, but I'm going to use um, D fire again. And the main reason why I'm kind of using um, this at this point is because we're going to do some pivots and stuff later. So just in case you're not um, familiar with, with pivot now, it's probably, probably good to use some simple examples. So I'm basically going to call this new table nodes. Um, and I'm going to use this actually to get data. And I'm going to just select our in and out columns. And I'm going to use the pivot longer function, basically just to create a long list, or um, we're going to move, we're going to combine in and out into one column and just create a unique um, list of characters. So we're using the pivot longer function. Um, so we're going to select first the columns that we want to move. Oops. Which is our in and out. I'm just going to move the names of this variable to column A because I don't need it. I'm just going to delete it in a minute. So it just basically says what it is. And then I'm going to put my values. In a column, and I'm going to type in what I'm saying. In a column, and I'm going to call it name underscore mat. And the reason why I do this is because I'm going to use this column in a moment um, to uh, match the. Um, so, because I'm going to need this to create the ID. So I'm going to match it, uh, I'm going to assign basically uh, a number using this 
um, using this really fond variable. So I'm not sure we need to put a dinosaur here. So all I've done after that pivot, I've generated the column, uh, two columns. It's given me a column name. It's basically taken this the, uh, the name of these two columns and popped it in here. And main math then has taken um, the values in the columns and put them in this new column. So with actually, I don't really think I mentioned this. So we're going to create this node data frame, and it will list every entity which I mentioned. So we're going to have two columns. In the end, <clears throat> we're going to have the name of the entity, entity with the underscore n, and we'll use this for the link ID that we're going to create. Um, and that's basically this one. And then we're also going to have the name entity with the number removed. And we're going to use this for our data labels. So I'm going to remove that first column because I don't want it. And I'm just going to use my escape function to remove any duplicates because we just want the, the distinct names in this data frame or this table. And you can see we've just got 18. So if you think about your psyche, there's that's basically 18 nodes. And I hope it's becoming clear now why I've, I've added in these underscore ones and underscore twos. So I wouldn't have been able to where I go and subtract the data and create that, um, create the, the table with the frequencies because it would have just um, read uh, this acute, each of these acute is the same column and separate. And if you don't do that, <clears throat> what you end up having is which often I think people get stuck at this point. Um, you only have like be able to get like two basic um to create arcs going from one to one or to another one. And um, so that's kind of a, a quick trick really for being able to um display your site the way that you want to. Right, so the next thing I'm going to do basically is going to bring another um variable here, just called name, and it's going to be the names which we'll use as labels in our, in our graph. <coughs> so I'm going to use the string so function. Basically, we're going to use this, and we're going to remove the characters at the end of our variable. Now this function is new to me and for some reason I thought that you would just type minus two and it would get rid of um, the last two factors but it just gets rid of the last one so you need to type three and I did not plan to type that as the case so I'm sorry. But if you type three, it works just fine. Okay, go. And what I'm going to do now as well, next, is create our ID. No, I'm going to do that to not do this. I'm going to do it in the next step. Sorry about that. So I'm going to leave that as that. I think I may have to come back to this and just let the end I know. But there, so that's our two columns with the names that we're going to use to create our ID and the names that we're going to use for our labels. So the next part we're going to create our ID. 
I'm going to hope this works now. So I'm going to call this one ID.id. Data. So I'm going to go back to our sanity plot data. I'm basically going to match um, the order. Um, so basically, I'm going to use this match function, which is new to me, um, and it returns the position of the order as match name. So basically, just the position that the variable is listed in. Um, but in Sankey, um, you have to start your um, the first um, ID has to start from zero. So we're also going to just minus one from it. I'm going to call this ID in equal to match. So I'm going to go in and then I'm going to match it to my nodes to the match in my nodes state frame or tipple. Actually, no, I'll leave this one more. I need to show you one more thing. I've just done it for in now first. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. And get rid of these. So all that's done is um, so it's pulled out, it said what well, okay, what order is this um is this character in this variable and it's it's first but we're gonna minus it one from it so that we get a zero so this is our origin point in our sanity which is set to zero and then our, the next value two and that becomes a one and so on and so forth um <clears throat> and to make sure that our source nodes become our target nodes. To make sure that our target nodes become our source nodes, we basically need to have the same ID uh, for our out variables as well. So it's going to do exactly the same thing as just on here. So nodes. And now you can see here we've got a hit two um, is a one, and a hit two here is also a one. We, if we scroll down, we've got a hit three is six. And it's a six here. And if we cocktail, if we take a look at our nodes um, table again, um, if we look here, that acute three is in row seven, so it's a minus one, it becomes a six. So they're, they're joined. And this is important for when we create our graph. So I hope that all makes sense. Um, the next thing we need to do is change our tables to um, data frames. Otherwise, um, the network D3 package won't work. The exact same thing here. Okay, 
two. Right, so now we're ready to create a graph because we have everything we need, um, which is the, we have a linked ID and we have the number of clones that are linked or, or nodes are, are joined together. And we have the names as well of our variables that we want to engage in our graph. So we need to use this assign key network function. And the first thing we need to do is just specify the data frame that contains the link, which is our assign key dot ID. Contains our nodes, which I've just called nodes. The next thing we need to add in is the source, which um, we have called ID in, and our target, which we have called ID out. We need to add in our value which we have called frequency. Um, our node ID, which we have called name. So I'm gonna quickly just say my name. So in our ID, we've got our ID in and our ID out. That's what I've included here. And in our nodes data frame, In a Sankey plot ID um, data frame, we also have our frequency, so pop that in. And then in our nodes data frame, we've got our node, our node the name that we're going to include. So if we run that, it should create a Sankey diagram. Now it doesn't look very nice, it looks okay, but we, we'll do the plot in, in a minute just so we can change how it looks. Does that work for everyone? Cool. Any questions? Sorry, to, uh, uh, apologies for my ignorance. Um, I just wondered if you could, um, I'm not quite grasp, grasping the idea of the in out. So I understand obviously the frequency of going from acute one to discharge one, or but I'm not quite understanding sort of the node in out concept. Okay, yeah. Sorry, thank you. No, that's fair enough. Um, so if we can um right, so what's so we've got our so we need to generate our ID based on um the name. So we've generated our ID based on the names of um, of our different entities. Um, so here, for example, like this is acute, but in our, in our we call it, it's technically acute one. So it's basically a sum of each of these values for acute one. So each of these equals to 1300, 400, whatever. Um, and then if we go from acute one to acute two, so that's 1,845. So if you hover over the span key, it will show you that it's 1845. So this is going from 0 to 1, 0 to 1. But you can see that from um, acute 2, so if we think back to our, I'll, I'll actually show you something else in a second, which should hopefully make it a little bit clearer as well. But from acute 2, then you've got um, other patients who have had another subsequent readmission or the discharge has been or died. So attached to each of them um, of these sources becomes a new target. So it goes from the source to the target and then the target becomes the source. And then from that source there's another kind of series of targets. 
So if we go back to our patient level data that we have at the survey, um, we've got a, basically a list of series of readmissions. So this person, one here is acute, is going to, they've had an acute admission, then within 30 days they've had another acute readmission, and then they've had another discharge all within kind of a series. So basically this person is one of this, so it's, and then they form one of this, and then they go to this discharge point. Does that kind of explain it a bit? Better? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. That I, I think what I was struggling was to just see the comparison between obviously that um, and then the data, and then thinking about, like you said, about the different sort of levels that they flow through, I guess. But no, that explains it really well. Thanks a lot. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Cool. Yeah. I personally um, am a bit funny when get doing the cut out when graphs don't look good. Probably like most of you, so I spent a bit of time trying to figure out how to format all of better. You know, it's not I haven't it's still not perfect, but it looks Kind of nice. So I'll take you through some things that we can do to make it um, look a bit better. I forgot to say actually you could actually move these around yourself um, as well. I haven't yet figured out how to, I don't know if there's a way where you can like specify the order of things and stuff like that, which would be kind of nice to do, especially if you're comparing kind of groups of readmissions among different patient groups. Um, the first thing we want to do a um, we can change kind of the width of these nodes. We can also change the font um, and the height as well. And we can we can move the so at the moment it's kind of I don't know what the kind of word would be because it's spread across the space. We can kind of change it so that it's um, kind of sinks right. This is left or it doesn't sync for. So I'm going to just copy this. Ooh. And the first thing I'm going to do is um, I'm going to change it so that it doesn't sync right. And all you have to do is just set it default. And it just shifts it over to the left. I personally think it's a, it looks a bit neater this way. You may think different and um, totally up to you. You can move um, these around so that they are in um, I don't know, an order that you might prefer them to be in or that there's a bit more space. The annoying thing is if then you make another change, it tends to revert back. So um, I would probably avoid move things around until you can kind of like a final version. The next thing I'm going to do is change my font size um because it's really small. I'm going to try maybe a 12 so you can make it bigger. Um, and you can also change your font type which is your font family. Um, I'm just going to make it aerial for now, but I can't remember if there's a specific list um, that you can use. I'd rather be in the extra fonts than haven't used it a lot. You can see it's gone from time. It's changed to aerial. We can make it the fonts a little bit bigger again if we wanted to. Um, what you can also do actually is once you've got your data in the right format as well, if you don't want to format it in, or you can import it into Power BI and they have um, a, um, I can't remember what they're called, um, a graph type that you can add to your Power BI. And um, especially if you're doing kind of like interactive dashboards, then people can hop over and take a look at the values themselves and see what the patient numbers are flowing to. 
So, and then if you want, you can change the notes, please. Is it, then, I yes. will, is it possible to put data labels on it? That's a really good question. Um, it's like I did think, like if there's ways you could potentially add some labels. Like if you've got values, you could maybe add them to your name, um, to your name labels for your graph. But the problem is then that you're you'll only be really looking at kind of your nodes. Like you, but basically, in short answer, no, and um, not within this packet, or at least not that I'm aware of. I have tried. Uh, All right, thank you. Um, yeah. So it's, that's, I guess, one of the limitations of it. So unless you're kind of maybe just taking your data then and popping it in Power BI or joining up the org to Power BI, um, it's good as a kind of quick visualization. And I, in the next part of the session, um, we can compare what the kind of readmission series groups look like for two different patient groups. Um, and you can kind of see the difference. So you can change the size of the node width. Um, you can make them really big if you want to just leave them as they are. Um, and then the last thing is the node padding, which I can't remember what exactly it does, but let's see. I think it just So the next thing we're going to show you to do is change these colors. Um, we're going to use the speed tree scale ordinal function, which isn't quite a function. Um, I'm not entirely um, familiar with it, but basically what it allows you to do is kind of create um, a new ordinal scale, scale that you can use for colors and their names, and then you can assign um, and then you can change the colors on the graph by adding um, a new column to your notes table, which basically groups um, your um, which groups your kind of acute um, notes, for example, so they all be the same color, and your discharge notes. So to do this, I'm just going to call it node color. D3 scale ordinal dot domain um, it, so in this part we'll add the names of our colors. So we've got like six um, groups. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, I have got some hex colors already in here. So if you want to just use mine or if you have a list of your favorite colors on there, um, and all you do, I'm going to give them names in a second. Purple, lilac, 
green, red, yellow, grey and blue. I'm just going to copy any colours, colour codes. for somewhere I can't see it. So hopefully it will work. So all I've done is just created some colours. That's literally all I've just done there. And the next thing you need to do is create a new variable in my known state of frame. And I'm going to call this color group. And I'm going to use a place where basically all I'm going to do is um, for the color that I want to change. Um, so I'm going to want to change acute to um, a lilac color. So I'm just going to make sure that um, where I'm going to create a new character variable um, and where the name is equal to acute. I'm going to um, create a new character. So basically I'm going to have two new colors, uh, one new volume and where um, anywhere it says it's going to be cute and it's going to say lilac. So basically, a color is going to be attached to um, each of the names um, shown on our graph. I'm going to make crystal clear purple. to make discharged green. What do we have? We've got the strip down. So I'll make that uh, the yellow. For those who pass away, I'm going to have a kind of a light red. Um, and if it's not completed, it's going to have it as a gray. Oh, oh, no. Oh, I forgot to add in my party at the end. Got ahead of myself. Um, I'm just going to show you what that's done. So I've just created a new column. And what will happen now is we can add this into our um, network banking function um, and it will when we assign a color group um, it will pick up these colors that we've just we created earlier and will change the color of the nodes. So I'm going to just copy this exact same graph and I'm going to add to it. 
So what I need to do is specify my color scale, which I call color color. I called it north color. Change the size of your graph as well. You can avoid it from doing this. Um, so I'm going to change the height maybe to 350. And I'm going to change the width to maybe 600. But there you have it, the kind of final version. I tend to maybe just move things up a little bit. But does anyone have any questions? Cool. Well, that's the end of the first part. Um, I want to take a bit of a break. Should we maybe come back to 11? So if anyone can come back for 11 a.m., so that's 15 minutes. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Great. I hope everyone managed to get some coffee and then just, I don't know, stand up walk around for a minute or two. Um, so this part, we, in this section, we are going to... Um, Bear with me two seconds. I have completed the script, but not the uh, final script. I'm not going to quickly delete some of the stuff so that I can do it as I go along. But if you remember um, from what I shared earlier in the morning, what we're going to do is now create a unique readmission ID for our groups of. Um, admissions that happen within 30 days of discharge. Um, now, this, some clever people may have another way of doing this, um, but this is what I've come up with. So if anybody has any like suggestions for improvements or has experience of doing something similar, it would be great if we could um, get in touch and share your script for ideas. Um, fine. I'll leave it at this point. Right. So I'll quickly just pop up the presentation. I'm just going to share my screen again. Which I did not realize earlier. So sorry about that. So. So just a bit of a recap. So what we did this morning was we basically transform our data from that readmission row level data um, to create um, our safety diagram. And but what we're going to do now is go from kind of sus structured data to this readmission row level data and um, create a graph as well. Um, let's get rid of that. So I hope you have um, managed to install and load the data. So if we take a look at the data, so I'm just going to firstly take a look at the format. So in here I've got personal ID and an admission ID, and then admission date, a discharge date, a discharge status and the critical care flag. 
I've also got another variable which I've added in, um, which denotes a health condition. So what I'm going to do, what we'll do is we'll filter um, out our data. So we'll make a sample graph first for this condition and then for the next condition. I haven't specified what they are um, because I just wanted the data to be fully anonymized. Um, but then that we can see kind of how readings is um, and I guess how um, the needs, I guess, of patients can vary for different conditions, especially ones that might be getting a bit more acute or new that we don't know much about. Um, so what we need to do is change the format of our admission dates and our discharge dates, because at the moment they're read as character strings. Um, and we will need to have them in the right format because we're going to do um, kind of use our arrange function and our group by function and stuff like that to create new variables. And I'm also going to change this critical play, uh, use this critical care variable to create an admission type variable. Um, so basically, if it's critical care, then it's one percent acute. So here I'm using the mutate at function. Um, and I'm asking more basically just to convert these two variables into a date type. Let's just run that row, glimpse the data. We can see that they're now dates. And that's what we need. Um, and then to create the admission type, I'm just I just use the if else function. Um, which works the same way as it does, I guess, in Pentex itself. Um, and if we run that, and basically, anywhere where there's a null, we've got an acute, and where there's a one, we've got critical care. And I'm going to remove that critical care flag column because we don't need it anymore. So we've got some information in here basically on our person ID, the admissions they had, the dates, whether or not they were discharged or went to step in bed or passed away. We've got um, which health condition their admission relates to, um, and also the admission type. So I'm going to filter by condition one for now. And to create um, our readmission ID, we need to group readmissions within 30 days. So basically what I'm trying to do is come up with some sort of ID that will group any kind of flows of admissions and readmissions within 30 days. And if it's more than 30 days, and I'm going to um, stop the flow. And, but if they do have a subsequent readmission after 30 days, then they'll start again and have a new admission series for cycle. So, first, so to create this ID, we need to identify um, the first admission so that we can um, then use our group by and row number to generate a new, unique ID. Every num every kind of group of admissions per patient. Um, so I, there's a couple of different parts to this to basically creating the ID. So what I'm going to do is just do each kind of section separately and then I'll bring them all together into one. Um, so it's kind of just clear what I'm doing at, at each step. Um, and after each step, what's happening to the data as well. Basically, I'm just going to call this the bit. And I'm going to use filter data to know what I created. Um, 
like a lunar range, the dates of my Chris and my baby. Separation date, um, discharge date. And all this does is basically just sort the data in the order we need, we're going to need. So I'm going to just run this now. I'm going to take a quick look at the data. Oops. So you can see our, what um always done. It's basically ordered by discharge date, then by admission date, and then by personal date. Because what we're going to do is basically um, calculate the number of days between this discharge date and this admission date. And if we didn't order them, then we wouldn't be able to do this. Um, I'm going to do this in a few. So I'm going to do this first with egg grouping by the person, just to show you what happens to the data. But then we're going to do it using the group by because we um, um, because it's important because we'll need to group by the dates. We don't. We only want to calculate the difference between the dates for the same patient. We don't necessarily want to do it for different patients. So we're going to use the div time function and basically it's time one minus time two. So I'm going to take the lag of the discharge date and that just takes the discharge date in the preceding time or preceding row, sorry. And I'll show you what this given us. So what happens here is it's calculated the difference in seconds. We're not necessarily interested in seconds, so that would make our job a little bit harder here. So you could specify the unit just by doing a comma after the discharge date. So we've got unit equal to days. If we take a look at the data again, it specifies the unit in the days, specifies the difference in days. So here um, we can see this person is discharged on the 60, um, and they're readmitted again one day later on the 70. They spent one day in hospital and they have had another readmission, or they're admitted again much later on in the year, and 278, 287 days later. So what we're going to want to do in a moment is group these two admissions together, but make sure this one stays separate and this will be a, a readmission on its own or an admission on its own. Um, if we look down to patient number 17, we can see they had this person's a frequent attender and they're having lots of admissions um, within a short period of time. So we would ask, we're going to want to group basically with the first seven, six or seven, so we can't group with them, um, into one, but they've had another further um, admission, which was more than 64 days, but because that's more than 30 days, we're going to think that as a separate admission, separate admission cycle. And um, here we've generated an NA, and that's basically because. Um, or count minus nothing from something, so it generates an NA. And one other thing to point out here is that the unit isn't days. We need to work with numbers, so I'm going to convert this to a numeric. So this is C6. I'm going to just do it this way for now. Um, 
but you could basically add it as an alphanumeric function to the tip time section and it would do the same thing. And it's converted it to a number. If you don't believe me, we can print the text that is former. And this is now the number. Um, the other thing that we're going to want to do is, as you can see here, um, this is a, um, a different patient, but OR is still calculating the difference between um, this admission and this discard. Um, but they're for two different people, so they're not related. So if you add a group body, uh, function to your query and so we're going to group by person ID um, it will only um, run this function or this um, these two lines of code for at that patient level Finished. So as you can see here, um, for anywhere um, where there's a new patient and they don't have any more admissions, it's just going to show an error. So if we go back to that person 17, for example, who's had lots of admissions, their first one anyway. Um, and for any other um, admission, it's calculated the difference except for the first one. I hope that makes sense. Yep, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a binary which will tell me if the readmission took place within 30 days of diagnosis or within 30 days of discharge. Um, so basically, I'm just going to have a zero here and a one here. Or anywhere where it's more than 30, so it shows a zero. I'm going to call this readmission it's going to use the object I've just created. New date. And if we take a look at the data, you can see exactly what's happened. Um, so we can actually now use this variable to create um, a new column, which we can then use to identify um, basically the first um, the first admission in the series, because we know anywhere where there's an NA it's going to be the first one in the series. And anywhere with anyone where there's a zero as well, it would also be the first in the series because um, as I explained earlier, when we do our group by, you can't minus uh, something that doesn't exist from another date or number. And then any new, any zero is 
basically um, a new um, rear business cycle. So what I'm going to do next is um, I just realized that I did a group by here, so I'm going to ungroup. I don't want to have any problems in a minute. So I'm going to use, um, I'm going to arrange my data first, um, and then I'm going to use info to basically say if this is any, give me a one, otherwise give me a zero. But I'm actually not going to say give me a one or zero. I'm going to say it's the first spin series. And then we can use this variable then to use a row number now. And we'll get like a sequential number of um, admission cycles per patient. And then we'll use our fill function to assign any kind of associated um, admissions within that cycle with the same value. And then we can create an ID. So I'm going to go to patient 17 again, actually, that's going to be helpful. So when we create this next variable, what's going to happen is um, this will show us as a first, we're going to have NAs everywhere, there's a one. And this zero will be, um, will also show first. Now, to do this now. So we we'll call this one the admission first. I'm going to just arrange my data just to be sure that it'll be in the right order. And I think this is will be more beneficial for the next step as well than here for now. So, be totally sure. So I'm going to use if else. I'm going to use the base or if else for this because um, the other one doesn't work so well when you're trying to generate NAs. So I'm going to say if our readmission within sorry, readmission within 30 days, if that name or if um, our radius mission within 30 days equals zero, then I want to show me it first. So this, is, this will then be the first in the cycle, first submission in the cycle. Otherwise, just oops, make it any. And if we look at our data, anywhere there's an NA, it's a first, and anywhere where there's zero, there will be a first. So pop down to person 17 again. Um, the first, um, well, there's an NA here, which is their first in its sequence. Um, where there's a one, it's showing us NA, because in a moment we're going to, um, give this, these rows basically the same number as what this value will be, because these admissions are all part of the same cycle. But when we move on to the admission that they've had, after 30 days, that then becomes the first. So I'm saying this over and over again, but um, 
I hope it's, it's, it's clear. Yeah, I'm going to use what I've just created here um, to use the row, fun row number function and we'll rank the number of readers in cycle per patient. I'm just going to call this read machine number. You're going to use what we've just created here. I'm going to just pop this row in again. I'm just doing it for fear. These will go away or I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, but just in case, and I'm going to group by. Person ID and this readmission first variable. And then by grouping by each of these, when we use our own number, it will um, basically rank each, it will rank by person ID and readmission first. I'm going to call this one readmission group. Again, I'm going to use the place or if else. Um, so I'm working with some NAs again. So I'm going to use if, if, if a readmission group is NA, if a readmission first is NA, then I want that to be on A line. Otherwise, I want to rank. Create a rank order, a rank number. And if we take a look at this table, um, what we have here is we've got a one for the first time we have a first, and a two for the second time we have a first for each patient. So I think if we look at this. Yeah, so if you filter your person ID by three, 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 um, this person's had uh, a number of um, pre admission cycles. So this will be their first one. Then they've had a second one here where the date is greater than 30, or the number of days is greater than 30. Um, Oh, let's filter here somehow. It's showing up every two to three. Um, I can't quite remember if I filter by. What I'm going to do is just create a quick subset. So they've had their first uh, series of, re of admissions and they've had a second series of readmissions. Re if we scroll down, oh, after all that, they didn't have any more story with that. Um, I will find another person. So this person, ID 7069, they've had five. So let's take a look at what's happened to them. This part wasn't on the script, obviously. Um, so 
So you can see here, this person had um, five read, well, they've had seven readmissions, but um, five have been kind of can be classed as like the series or a group um, because they didn't as technically meet the criteria of having a readmission within 30 days of discharge. So here we've got our first. Uh, they've got a second one. If we look, the number of days was 74. Um, this will be part of this group because it's only seven day difference and so on and so forth. So they've had five in a 12 month period. Um, the next thing I want to do is. Um, going to want to fill these NAs in. Um, so here I'm going to want this to be a one um, because it's associated with the same cycle. And for example, in this, this person, we're going to want this to be a two and this to be a three. The first time I ever did this, I probably spent um, about um, you know, a week maybe. <laughs> maybe about two or three days trying to figure out how, how to do this. Um, and I ended up really volunteering and like, creating you know, my own phone team to do it. And then at the OR conference, um, somebody just presented and they showed this uh, fill function, which is about just super handy. Um, and it's basically one line, um, but that's the joy, I guess, of learning OR. Um, so, I'm going to call this one readmission ID. Readmission number. Group five. And I am being absolutely terrible at removing my group guys. So I'm just going to ungroup here as well. A group guys. Person ID. And I want to fill the readmission group column. And I'm going to ungroup. And if we look at our data, it's done what we wanted it to do. So we've got a one here. Um, let's take a look at this person again. We've got one, we've got twos, and we've got threes. That's exactly what we need. And then the final part, just to get that unique ID per readmission group, um, we just think I've just decided in the end it was the easiest to concatenate the person ID and this uh, readmission group. And we use our paste. Going to use the paint function from earlier just to join the two variables together. Join person ID. Um, I'm going to separate it with an underscore. And the reason why I do that is because if I don't, um, I run the risk of potentially having a really good ID that makes it the same. Um, so because they're all numbers. Do, do, do. And then I'm going to. Uh, okay. 
And then we'll just change this to a readmission ID. Readmission group, sorry, not that. We take a look at big data. Just got a unique ID now for each group or cycle of admissions that take place within 30 days of each other. I don't have any questions about that before we kind of move on. Anything in the chat? I know it's really some earlier, sorry. No, okay. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'll just bring it all in together into one. Just trying to think of the interest of time. In the interest of time, I probably won't go. Basically, this script just brings together all of these different pieces. Um, would it be helpful to just go through it once more? Or because we can technically just use this. Um, ready for the next part as well. I don't really want to go through once more. Okay, great. So what I'm going to do then is take what well, we've just created now. Um, um, I'm going to Going to select the columns that we need. So, So all we need to do is just select the readmission ID, the discharge date, we just need the admission date, the discharge date, the discharge status and the admission type column. Um, and then the next Part of what we're going to want to do um, is basically pivot our data wider so that our admissions appear in one row, our admission cycles. Um, before we get to that point, though, we need to um, just deal with the cases where we've got a high number of um, admissions or readmissions or interviews. Um, because we don't want to have loads of both in our graph, because it would just look a bit strange. So what I'm going to want to do first is, the first part of this uh, restructure or transformation um, is to create a new table with just three colleagues. So I'm going to have my readmission ID. I'm going to have my readmission ID. I'm going to have one date column the discharge date and um, another column which will tell us um, the admission and discharge status associated with that date. So I'm going to just call this object pivot long for now. Pivot long. Uh, I'm going to use the origin ID. The frame. Uh, I don't even use the pivot on the function. I'm going to specify the columns that I want to pivot longer, and I'm going to do that 
with the admission date and the discharge date. I'm going to move the values to a new guardian for dates. And I'm going to move the names to a guardian called date. Take a look at what's happened. We have um, basically doubled the number of rows um, to three to around thirty-five thousand, and that's because we've uh, created one column for the date. Um, What I'm going to do is make another change to the data um, because instead of having, for example, here, you know, we've also got um, duplicates of our discharge status and our admission. But what I'm going to want to do is where there's an admission date, I'm going to want a new column to show whether it's been acute or critical care. And where the date to discharge date, I'm going to want to show whether or not specify whether or not it's been the patient's been discharged or stuck there or died. So to do that, um, so for this admission and discharge status. Um, I'm going to use the date type. Um, so if the date type is equal to admission date, then I'm going to want or to give me the value that's in the admissions status value. So I'm double check that I have called that the right thing. Nope, I'm going to submit the type, sorry. Otherwise, um, I'm going to want whatever's in our discharge status volume. So quickly run that. And you can see what's happened here. Now we've got the admission and discharge status on it and the date as well alongside that. So for this person, they, we can just give their admission on this date, discharge on this date, they have another admission, which is they were discharged. Now this is all part of the same flow or sequence. But um, ideally, we're going to want to kind of remove any um, uh, roles where discharge isn't, where our discharge status isn't the last vertical. Um, otherwise, our sanctions are done, we'll, probably, we'll look a bit funny. So if you think back to the way we thought we had it structured, um, we've got acute going to acute if somebody's had a readmission. And if we don't remove this jury, this these uh, mid mid point or um, references to discharge before the cycle ends, you would have so we're going from acute to discharge, then into acute into discharge. I would just make it very long and unwieldy. So I suggest that it's best to remove those. And we can easily do that just by um, I'm going to use the filter function. So I'm going to call this filter discharge. Or you should say to just 
Then this button bit by bit so it's kind of clear. I don't want it for it by our radius mission ID for this part as well. So we're going to want to have um, counts of the number of raid missions, and then we're also going to get the maximum number of raid missions. And anywhere where it says discharged and the order of the admission and the maximum number are equal, then we can just filter it out and it will get rid of those discharged preferences. So I'll just show you what's happening here. So we've got, this was the first, this is the second part, this is the third and the fourth and so on. Then it starts again, so we group by patient. So this is one, two, and if we go to patient 17, we've got a few admissions. So here they've got like a lot. Um, so it's like, So really, we're going to want to get rid of this one, we're going to want to get rid of that, and that, and that. So what I'm going to do now is basically get the maximum value for this. And if it says discharged here and these numbers aren't equal, I'm going to get rid of them. I'm just going to create filter variable so it's clear exactly what I'm filtering out and why. And anywhere where it says a one here, I'm going to get rid of all these rows. You don't need them, just come out. Kind of. They've got a bigger graph of brain, they're just kind of a bit redundant anyway. Um, Discharge status. 
the admission. So that was and if we look over here. This is what we have. We were trying to create a start, if you remember. It was just a table with three columns for a readmission ID, a date, and the discipline styles. Um, if we so the next thing we want to do is try and remove um so I think that I'll show you in a moment, but there's some patients of a really high number of readmissions. And um, for one person, for example, you do get 21 um interactions and each is within 30 days of the judge. So instead of kind of displaying all of that in sanity, I want to tap the potential entities or nodes at five. I've just chosen five and um, it kind of seemed a bit sensible when I was doing it. But you can you can change it whatever you to whatever you want if you want to in the future. So here I'm going to just check the number of potential entities that I could have in my data. Um, and to do this, I'm going to use the group by and the row number again. Um, I think this is a capital data. Oh, I'm using the wrong data frame. So I need to use this one. Sorry, the filter destroyed one. Or, and that should hopefully work. Yes, it has. So, yeah, so this person has got like 21 potential, um, has 21 uh, admissions, basically, to account for. So I'm going to cap that at five, and then for anything that's greater than five, I'm just going to say that it's not being completed. It's less than one percent, as you can see from like the top of the page. Coming on. So I'm going to. Uh, 
parentheses. I have to find something that is not perfectly. Well, the first thing you want to do is just define the complex space. Um, I could have just called this a frequent itinerary. I'm actually got this continuum of it. But, um, so we're going to use our if else the flow number n is less than 5. No, it's greater than five. Then I want to one and zero. And this will just give me a binary to indicate if it's a frequent attendant. Oh, I spelled this wrong. Flown number n. So if anybody who's kind of new to ours on the webinar today, most of your errors are probably going to be in the last seven or typing things correctly like most of mine. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is um, where the, um, um, where, for example, in this case, um, here we've got like the sequence or the order of the entities. And if it's something more than five, I'm just going to change all these for, to five for now. Um, because I'm going to filter them out in order. Now, I'm going to feel easier and straightforward way to do this, but this is the way I've come up with doing it, so I'm sorry if it's kind of a bit convoluted. So, I'm going to call this entity staff. So, if our number is greater than five. I'm going to want it to be a five, otherwise, I'm just going to want it to be the flow number. And I think I'm getting a little tired now because I'm making silly mistakes. So, if our flow number is greater than five, I'm going to want it to show five. If it's below five, if it's five or below, then just give me the phone number as it's specified. I'm missing a bracket. Let's copy this in.
this one is working. What's wrong with this blue one? So it's saying it's just an awareness of it, right? Just That's right. What I've done is I've just uh, rerun kind of my clean script. I know I could have cut there at some point. Um, so if you have the actual code, you just want to rerun kind of like this part where it says bring it all together and then these two pieces and it'll work. I'm not quite sure what's going on. Something to do with the format related to this. So if you take a look at our data, so if you remember, it's gonna bring that data to that lots of um, admissions in the series. So I've identified them as a complex case or a person who's got lots of frequent attendances. Um, and all I've done is Tracked their um, number of admission, number of potential um, parts in the process that followed. I'm going to filter those out because um, I'm just going to show them it's not completed. But I just do filter. number estimates. It could have just done this straight away, but I kind of just wanted to show you guys what I was doing. And if we go to this person again, you can just see we've got five, just five points that we're going to show on the graph for this particular admission. Um, what I also want to do next is I don't want I want to change the admissions display status um, so that instead of saying acute here, I'm going to want to show it's not complete. Um, I call, I'm going to call this flow um, for now because we'll use it in a moment again later. So I find this as a character variable. So all I'm going to do is when the um, a variable entity count is equal to five and 
Voilà. If I'm jumping ahead to the uh, supposed to do this in uh, places. Sorry. So case when the MC cap is white and we have a complex case a plus a plus one. I'm going to want it to show it's not completed. Um, and when our entity cap is less than five, then we are just going to, going to want it to be the exact same as what's in our division history. So this variable. I'll show you what we've done. I'll go to So all I've done here is just change this from the secure to not complete. Similarly, for this person as well, who's, they have 13. Um, so instead of this showing as critical care, then your shows will not complete. I'm almost there. And then the next step is to just um, select the variables we want to need for the next type. Which is our array admission ID. This we're going to keep this flow one that we've just created now, and the number of flows which we may not need to put it put it properly in because um, it was useful when we were sharing the transformed file for the first part of the event just happened in there, um, and the entity capped, which is just our number basically of entities or nodes or points in the process. And I'm not going to bring it all together because I'll just be repeating what I've just done. So we have that script. Um, and then the next thing we're going to do is pivot wider. I'll just delete this and rewrite it back in. So here we're going to pivot wider basically to get that weird machine level data that we shared with you for the first part of today. Pivot wide. It's not for complex cases. Then go entity cap. Please pivot wider. Function. The names are wrong. Our entity cap. Okay. I'm going to take the names here and we're going to transpose them basically across. Oops, sorry, getting the head up. We're going to take the values from. And what we're going to do in here as well is add a prefix. Um, of an underscore so that then it specifies the number of values. Um, if we look at it, 
את ה... We have got um, our readmission level data, which is shared with you this morning when we did the first kind of series of flows. Oh, so basically. Are there any questions or comments or anybody first to do something similar before? Cool. Take time to the know. Um, do you basically the next part of this script is just redoing what we did this morning? Um, would it be helpful to go through again, or um, or or not? Basically, so I'm just going to run everything, and it should create a graph. Hopefully. If no, then I might just send uh, the two different graphs for the different conditions and show you the difference. So I'm just going to run the full script again. So this is basically the exact same graph as we did this morning. And if I go way back to my top, and I decide I want to actually see what the readmission activity is for this particular group of patients, um, then I can do that. Um, like if you're interested in what's happening across age groups or anything like that, you can filter your data at this point. So, um, so So you can see here for the first condition that we were looking at, and um, there's a much higher proportion of people. Um, there's a comparably higher proportion of people ending up in critical care, and also um, those who are passing away as well, um, compared to this group. So we get to much much lower as a proportion. Um, also, you've got a larger proportion of people who have been discharged, which suggests that this condition is because the people are being managed better. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of how it can be used as well. Any questions? Uh, yeah, sorry, me again. <laughs> I just had one about um, sort of publishing it. Um, and trying to keep some of that interactivity. So if you use something like R Markdown, would that still sort of keep the interactivity in terms of hovering over it and moving it and things like that? Yeah, I don't know. That's a cool question. Actually, I haven't tried that. And I was thinking when I was making this, I wonder if you could turn it into like a shiny um, thingy with your gate. Sorry, I can't remember what they're called. Uh, put it on shiny platform. Shiny app, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Thanks. 
Um, so that could be a potential solution um, because it is when it's static, you're kind of like, oh, it's just some, oh, it's something. Graphic yeah, content. no, I mean, it's, it still looks really nice. Like, yeah, it's a really yeah. interesting graphic, so, obviously. I think the interactivity is really, really cool in it as yeah. well. And, like, what you can do, like, you, like, what you could do is if you've got dashboards, it's probably an extra step, but you can read, once you've got the script set up, you can run it for any position or any, whatever, and then you can just import the data and see into Power BI if you use that or whatever it might be, um, or if you're Power BI in or did it link up or whatever if you do that. Um, but I've signed up to the shiny NHSR event, so maybe you might see if it, if it can be reacted further or anything like that. Yeah. But if I do, like if I am doing any kind of uh, summary of the analysis, this is just, will just be one part of it. There'll be like content, it's content going through it. Doesn't tell you. It's really nice to look at, and you can see immediately here that there's something happening with this compared to this, but not, not a lot, lot of detail. Yeah, no, no, definitely. No, thanks a lot. That was that was really good. Thank you. Any more questions for Lisa? No, people are dashing up, Wayne. Um, so in the chat, I've just popped the SurveyMonkey link for those of you who are nipping off. Um, I'll stay logged in for a little while just so you can download the link and go to the SurveyMonkey through the questionnaire. That would be really grateful, really helpful for us as well to get some information back. Any more questions? We can hang on to about 12.30 if anyone's got any questions. Yeah, sorry, me again. <laughs> um, I just had another question just in regards to, um, obviously, I found this really helpful. Um, and do you do it quite regularly? Like, what sort of is the, you know, sort of um, frequency with which you do these types of things, these events? Is it quite common? Or obviously, know that you've got the NHSR community, which has got loads of great stuff. But um, sort of having a run through like this was, was really helpful. So I don't know how sort of frequently you do these sorts of events is that for me or for lisa uh, I, I, yeah uh, both of you i guess yeah i'm not sure whether you obviously run it with different people i'd, I'd assume uh well for lisa i'll let you answer first yeah. your because your particular project yeah. so uh i guess i did a 10 15 minute presentation at the nhs or conference and then it was asked to make a webinar out of it so this is my first time reading anything like this um, but the NHS or team do run a series of events and workshops um, and definitely check out their web page and just I follow them on Twitter, which is handy to say nice and um, new bits and pieces coming up. But yeah, it's, um, yeah, I guess you're right, probably a better place than me to kind of add further detail. So in terms of NHSR, we've got a bundle of events and workshops going ongoing. Um, I think the next one, let me just go to the website. If you go to our website, the next one we've got, I think is Intro to R. Um, and that's ran every, um, I'm sure it's every two weeks by Zoe Turner. So they're ongoing and I think they're fully booked up until, let's have a quick look, events. Um, let's have a look. So the next one for Zoe is do, 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 um, April, um, and that's you can um, register via our website via Eventbrite. Then um, we've just put a course on yesterday, at short notice to run this with you for Chris Beely, Intro to Shiny, and that starts on the thirtieth. It's a three day course, um, the thirtieth to the thirteenth, and then um, we're also doing Barham is doing a um, foundation of time series forecasting using R. That will be in April, which unfortunately is fully booked. <laughs> um, I think he's doing another series of workshops in the autumn, um, which we haven't advertised yet, but that will be um, probably an intermediate advanced workshop. 
But if you keep looking on our website, we're putting workshops on all the time. We've got a list um, to the end of the year of workshops. And we have webinars every month on a Wednesday. So we had a webinar yesterday. Um, and then our next webinar is in April 21st with Gary Hudson. Um, and that's on um, NHS Data Dictionary. It's a package that he's designed um, to do lookups in the NHS and date and easily access information. So that's the 21st. You can sign up for that. All our workshops um, and webinars are free to any NHS employee or anyone in the public sector. If you're private sector, unfortunately, we give first refusal to um, NHS and public sector. So that's why sometimes we have to cancel the tickets. Um, just in case you know you know a colleague who's going to sign up, just to let them know that NHS and public sector is first refusal. But yeah, by all means, go to the website and you'll find for the year we've got things lined up. There's webinars for the whole year and there'll be workshops coming up. And then in November, fingers crossed, um, depending on what restrictions we can have, we'll go back to our NHS, NHSR conference face-to-face. -face, and that's booked for Edgebaston Cricket Ground in November. Wonderful, thank you so much. That's, that's really useful Probably information. One last thing to add, if anybody else is doing kind of interesting things or things that might be useful to other people in the community, then I would recommend getting in touch with Sharon and the team and pitching your ideas because it's, it's good experience to, I guess, it's good to share anyway, I guess, um, so we're all learning and good experience as well, just to practice um, um, presenting and sharing information with others. And also, if anyone wants to write a blog, um, by all means, we've got a blog section as well. Um, send the blog in to us. We have someone in the team that will review it, say if it's okay, and we'll review the blog for you. We can post that on our website for you as well. So we've got lots of things ongoing lots of people to engage in and if you want to do something for us you're welcome we'll just have a look and see what it is you want to do run it past um professor mohammed and then if he says yes then you're fine we'll post it up for you so i hope that all helps for everyone yeah so, that's great thanks <laughs> Oh, you're welcome. Okay, then, so I say um, thanks, Lisa, for doing this for you. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for all of you that have registered as well. So I can see there's a familiar names on here who have registered for um, some workshops coming up in the next few months. Um, so hopefully I'll see you guys probably in the next month or so when I sit another uh, co-host another workshop. So thank you all for registering. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining.